Aloha and good evening. Welcome to Middle Earth Story Time. My name is Edwin Boyette. I'll be your narrator, your storyteller this evening. Thank you for letting me into your home, by the way. That sounds moderately nefarious, Flash. <laughs> I'm in your house. The call's coming from within the house. I'm joined by our artist, our illustrator. <laughs> our uh, our free fall missile painter. Now, how 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 did you get what 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 was it? The Doctor Strange Love film. What what made you take up the habit of of painting missiles in flight and then parachuting there off? You know, because it's such a short lived piece of artwork. You've got. You it know. comes from my training as a monkey fighter. <laughs> I see. <laughs> you know, you because you you create these you create these beautiful works of art on these on these deadly weapons that are just going to to explode into pieces in a matter of minutes or seconds. So it's it's such an ethereal, short-lived form of life. It's the only true art. <laughs> It's almost, uh, correspondingly, it's like the life of a dragonfly, this <laughs> beautiful creature. It's destruction, man. <laughs> an, destruction is creation. An in-flight missile artist. All right. <laughs> Let's say, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Let me cough a few more times first. <laughs> Let's say hello to some people in the chat. And we need to recognize our royalty. We've we've lost one queen, but we've gained another. And today it appears to be Melissa Lester who was the first person to log into the chat. So by the power invested in me by the Tolkien Society, by the state of Hawaii, and by the Allman Brothers, if you will. The Allman Brothers. And to quote the Allman Brothers for, for Miss Lester's coronation, I would say, crossroads seem to come and go. Yeah. The gypsy flies from coast to coast, knowing many, loving none, bearing sorrow, having fun. But back home, he'll always run to sweet Melissa. Sweet Melissa, it is our pleasure to proclaim you the Queen of Chat. All right, I see Pooey McCleary. He says, Cor! <laughs> There's an Amy Lester. We're talking in some sort of code. It involves chairs and cupcakes and chocolate chip cookies and coffee and pancakes and, and more cupcakes and another chair. That's an intricate code. I like it, though. Claudius the Eighth says hello, everyone. Well, hello to you. Boy McClary says YouTube is trying to sell me stuff. So, with some of these videos, um, uh, approximately about one in five videos, I monetize it. Not because we're trying to get YouTube rich off of obscure nineteenth <laughs> century literature, but because, <laughs> excuse me, it helps make it more discoverable. And so hopefully good people will find our fellowship, the fellowship of the book. Pooey says, I just watched Disney's The Sword and the Stone. I was curious how one becomes king, rightful born of England. All right. Well, we just have to find some stones. Melissa Lester says, whoa, slick new look, Edwin. Well, yeah, I had to put I had to put Project Saruman on pause. Yeah, as some of you know in the audience, I am helping with a uh, campaign for Congress, and I've had to do a lot more public speaking, and so I didn't want my wizardly appearance to be a barrier to any voters or any campaign contributors. So, hence my. My slick look, I suppose. <laughs> I appreciate that, though. I'll take that. Slick is is definitely sounds like a compliment, so I'm going to count that one. 
Uh, Melissa Lester preemptively says thank you for another lovely evening of Art Flash. No pressure. Just make sure you do your best work ever, is all I'm saying. <laughs> Curious 2 Alpha. <laughs> Curious 2 Alpha gives us a wave and a smiley face with a bit of bit of tongue. <laughs> Not sure where you're going with that, but a little too early for romance. I'm still sipping my coffee. <laughs> Good to see you here. Amy Lester says, hmm, maybe you can audition for Aragorn on ice. I don't know if I have the craggy face. I think I'm, I'm moderately rugged looking with a beard, but I'm not sure I have the weather beaten look yet. I think I just have the beaten look. <laughs> I appreciate that compliment also. I will certainly accept that one. All right, and there is Amara hailing Queen Melissa. All right. We'll see if Queen Melissa has a righteous reign during this evening's programming. Have I missed anyone? I certainly hope not. And if you are if you're watching in replay or you come in later, please do introduce yourself to our audience. We have absolutely lovely audience just beautiful people and some of them so knowledgeable we I flash i think we learn something from our audience every show about literature and other topics so we have an audience with a broad skill set everything from computer coding to to art to literature to engraving to I think weapons. <laughs> I think we've got a professional wrestler in our audience. An accordion player. What more could you want? We've got skills. <laughs> to quote to quote Napoleon Dynamite, skills. <coughs> and be nice with the um call for depart. I'm, and it only seems to come on during showtime. I have no idea. Maybe it's the increased traffic and I'm catching some road dust wafting into my condominium. Who knows? It's magic. It's a mystery. All right. So we are reading George MacDonald's Lilith. And we're going to pick up in chapter 27, The Silent Fountain. Well, my scroll function is... A little too ambitious. There we go. It does not want to. It does not want to play nice. <coughs> Chapter twenty-seven, the Silent Fountain. I turned and followed the spotted leopardess, catching but one glimpse of her. She tore up the brow of the hill to the gate of the palace. When I reached the entrance hall, the princess was just throwing the robe round her, which she had left on the floor. The blood had ceased to flow from her wounds and had dried in the wind of her flight. When she saw me, a flash of anger crossed her face, and she turned her head aside. Then, with an attempted smile, she looked at me and said, I have met with a small accident, happening to hear that the Catwoman was again in the city. I went down to send her away, but she had one of her horrid creatures with her. It sprang upon me and had its claws in my neck before I could strike it. She gave a shiver, and I could not help pitying her, although I knew she lied. For her wounds were real, and her face reminded me of how she looked in the cave. My heart began to reproach me that I had let her fight unaided, and I suppose I looked with compassion, and I felt. Child of folly, she said, with another attempted smile, not crying, surely. Wait for me here. I'm going back into the black hall for a moment. I want you to get me something for my scratches. 
but I followed her close, out of sight. I feared her. The instant the princess entered, I heard a buzzing sound as of many low voices, and one portion after another, the assembly began to be shiftingly illuminated by a ray that traveled from spot to spot. Group after group would shine out for a space, then sink back into general vagueness, while another part of the vast company would grow momentarily bright. Some of the actions going on when thus eliminated, illuminated were not unknown to me. I had been in them, or had looked on them, and so had the princess, present when every one of them I now saw her. The skull-headed dancers footed the grass in the forest hall. There was the princess looking in at the door. The fight went on in the evil wood. There was the princess urging it. Yet I was close behind her all the time. She standing motionless, her head sunk on her bosom. The confused murmur continued, the confused commotion of colors and shapes and still the ray went shifting and showing. It settled at last on the hollow and the heath, and there was the princess, walking up and down, and trying in vain to wrap the vapor round her. Then, first, I was startled at what I saw. The old librarian walked up to her, and stood for a moment regarding her. She fell, her limbs forsook her and fled. Her body vanished. A wild shriek rang through the echoing place, and with the fall of her Adelon, the princess herself, till then standing like a statue in front of me, fell heavily and lay still. I turned at once and went out. Not again would I seek to restore her. As I stood trembling beside the cage, I knew that in the black ellipsoid I had been in the brain of the princess. I saw the tail of Leopardus quiver once. While still endeavoring to compose myself, I heard the voice of the princess beside me. Come now, she said. I will show you what I want you to do for me. She led the way into the court. I followed in day's compliance. The moon was near the zenith, and her present silver seemed brighter than the gold of the absent sun. She brought me through the trees to the tallest of them, the one in the center. It was not quite like the rest, for its branches, drawing their ends together at the top, made a clump that looked from beneath like a fir cone. The princess stood close under it, gazing up, and said, as if talking to herself, On the summit of that tree grows a tiny blossom, which it would at once heal my scratches. I might be a dove for a moment and fetch it, but I see a little snake in the leaves, whose bite would be worse to a dove than the bite of a tiger to me. How I hate that cat woman. She turned to me quickly, saying with one of her sweetest smiles, Can you climb? The smile vanished with the brief question, and her face changed to a look of sadness and suffering. I ought to have left her to suffer. But the way she put her hand to her wounded neck went to my heart. I considered the tree. All the way up to the branches were projections on the stem, like the remnants on a palm of its fallen leaves. <coughs> I can climb that tree, I answered. Not with bare feet, she returned. In my haste to follow the leopardess, disappearing, I had left my sandals in my room. It is no matter, I said. I have long gone barefoot. Again I looked at the tree, 
and my eyes went wandering up the stem until I lost my sight in the branches. The moon shone like a silvery foam here and there on its rugged bowl, and a little rush of wind went up through the top with a murmurous sound as of water falling softly into water. I approached the tree to begin my ascent of it. The princess stopped me. I cannot let you attempt it with your feet bare, she insisted. A fall from the top would kill you. So would a bite from the snake, I answered, not believing, I confess, that there was any snake. It would not hurt you, she replied. Wait a moment. She tore from her garment the two wide borders that met in top and kneeling on one knee made me first put my left foot, then my right on the other, and bound them about with the thick embroidered strips. You have left the ends hanging, princess, I said. I have nothing left to cut them off with, but they are not enough to get entangled, she replied. I turned to the tree and began to climb. Now in Bulika, the cold after sundown was not so great as in certain other parts of the country, especially about the sexton's cottage. Yet when I had climbed a little way, I began to feel very cold, grew still colder as I ascended, and became coldest of all when I got among the branches. Then I shivered, and I seemed to have lost my hands and feet. There was hardly any wind, and the branches did not sway in the least. Yet as I approached the summit, I became aware of a peculiar unsteadiness. Every branch on which I placed foot or laid hold seemed on the point of giving way. When my head rose above the branches near the top, and in the open moonlight I began to look about for the blossom, that instant... I found myself drenched from head to foot. The next, as if plunged in stormy water, I was flung about wildly and felt myself sinking, tossed up and down, tossed this way and tossed that way, rolled over and over, checked, rolled the other way and tossed up again. I was sinking lower and lower, gasping and gurgling and choking, I fell at last upon a solid bottom. I told you so, croaked a voice in my ear. I rubbed the water out of my eyes. Oh, excuse me, we're now in chapter 28. I am silenced. I rubbed the water out of my eyes and saw the raven on the edge of a huge stone basin when the cold light of the dawn reflected from his glossy plumage, he stood calmly looking down upon me. I lay on my back in water, above which, leaning on my elbows, I just lifted my face. <coughs> I was in the basin of the large fountain constructed by my father in the middle of the lawn. High over me glimmered the thick, still shiny stalk shooting with a torrent uprush a hundred feet into the air to spread in a blossom of foam. Nettled at the coolness of the raven's remark, You told me nothing, I said. I told you to know nothing. Anyone you distrusted asked you. Tut! How was mortal to remember that? You will not forget the consequences of having forgotten it, replied Mr. Raven, who stood leaning over the margin of the basin and stretched his hand across to me. I took it and was immediately beside him on the lawn, dripping and streaming. You must change your clothes at once, he said. A wetting does not dignify where you come from. Though at present such an accident is unusual, here 
It has inconveniences. <coughs> he was again a raven, walking with something stately in his step toward the house, the door of which stood open. I have not much to change, I laughed, for I had flung aside my robe to climb the tree. It is a long time since I molted a feather, said the raven. In the house, no one seemed awake. I went to my room, found a dressing gown, and descended to the library. As I entered, the librarian came from the closet. I threw myself on a couch. Mr. Raven drew a chair to my side and sat down. For a minute or two, neither spoke. I was the first to break the silence. What does it all mean? I said. A good question, he rejoined. Nobody knows what anything is. A man can only learn what a thing means. Whether he do depends on the use he is making of it. I have made no use of anything yet. <laughs> Not much. But you know the fact, and that is something. Most people take more than a lifetime to learn that they have learned nothing and done less. At least you have not been without the desire to be of use. I did want to do something for the children. The precious little ones, I mean. I know you did, and started the wrong way. I did not know the right way. That is true also, but you are to blame that you did not. I am ready to believe whatever you tell me, as soon as I understand what it means. Had you accepted our invitation, you would have known the right way. When a man will not act where he is, he must go far to find his work. Indeed, I have gone far. And got nowhere, for I have not found my work. I left the children to learn how to serve them, and have only learned the danger they are in. When you are with them, you were where you could help them. You left your work to look for it. It takes a wise man to know when to go away. A fool may learn to go back at once. Do you mean, sir, I could have done something for the little ones by staying with them? Could you teach them anything by leaving them? No, but how could I teach them? I did not know how to begin. Besides, they were far ahead of me. That is true, but you were not a rod to measure them with, certainly. If they knew what you know, not to say what you might have known, they would be ahead of you, out of sight ahead. But you say they were not growing, or growing so slowly they had not yet developed the idea of growing. They were even afraid of growing. You had never seen children remain children. But surely, I had no power to make them grow. You might have removed some of the hindrances to their growing. What are they? I do not know them. I did think perhaps it was the want of water. Of course it is. They have none to cry with. I would gladly have kept them from requiring any for that purpose. No doubt you would. The aim of all stupid philanthropists. Why, Mr. Vane? But for the want of weeping in it, your world would never have become worth saving. You confess you thought it might be water they wanted. Why did you not dig them well or two? 
That never entered my mind. Not when the sounds of water under the earth entered your ears? I believe it did once, but I was afraid of the giants for them. That was what made me bear so much from the brutes myself. I believe it did once. I, I believe it did once, but I was afraid of the giants for them. That was what made me bear so much from the brutes myself. Indeed, you almost taught the noble little creatures to be afraid of the stupid bags. While they fed and comforted and worshipped you, all of the time you submitted to be the slave of bestial men. You gave the Darlings a seeming coward for their hero. A worse wrong you could have hardly done them. They gave you their hearts. You owed them your soul. You might by this time have made the bags hewer of woods and drawers of water to the little ones. I fear what you say is true, Mr. Raven. But indeed... I was afraid that more knowledge might prove an injury to them, render them less innocent, less lovely. They had given you no reason to harbor such a fear. Is not a little knowledge a dangerous thing? That is one of the pet falsehoods of your world. Is man's greatest knowledge more than a little? Or is it therefore dangerous? The fancy that knowledge is in itself a great thing would make any degree of knowledge more dangerous than any amount of ignorance. To know all things would not be greatness. At least it was for the love of them, not from cowardice, that I served the giants. Granted, but you ought to have served the little ones, not the giants. You ought to have given the little ones water. Then they would soon have taught the giants their true position. In the meantime, you could yourself have made the giants cut down two-thirds of their coarse fruit trees to give room to the little delicate ones. You lost your chance with the lovers, Mr. Vane. You speculated about them instead of helping them. Which brings us to chapter 29. The Persian Cat. Persian. <laughs> P-U-R-R-S-I-A-N. Persian. No, it's not spelled that way. <laughs> what do we think so far, team? Are we enjoying the trials Mr. Vane. <sighs> Mr. Raven is a uh, bit of a harsh schoolmaster, if you will. We'll see where that goes. We're going to have, I guess, a brief intermission, and then we'll read another chapter. Flash, should we read one more, or should we read two more? What's your opinion, sir? I think one more is probably good, because it, uh, it leaves with a lot of... Revelation, revolution, if you will. Ah. <coughs> you sing you want a revolution. Ah. <laughs> well, you know who. All right. Let's have some. Let's have some intermission music. Hmm. Perhaps the force of softness would be the appropriate place to start. No, I think the emotional soundtrack. <laughs> Amy Lester in the chat says, Yes, he's a little cranky raven. Let's see. Get ourselves some music. We'll have a short intermission. Amy Lester says, and he's back home now. He's back at a semblance of his home. Whether or not it's his home, I would not swear to him. Thank you. 
Bible story time shall continue.
Welcome back to story time. Let's say, let's fix the display. Flash, as I was reading uh, the section with Mr. Raven kind of correcting Mr. Vane, it made me think that, that maybe the character Yoda was in some part borrowed from. The character Yoda was in some part borrowed from Mr. Raven. The kind of what was being communicated was was very similar to to some of <laughs> Yoda's comments to young Luke Skywalker. Again, so we have we have these archetypes, these relationships, these kind of paradigms established in literature, and then they echo down. They echo down through through literature and get manifested in in pop culture and different things. It's kind of interesting to find these patterns. Melissa, Melissa Lester says, kind of a cryptic mentor, that raven. Yes, indeed. <laughs> yes, indeed. All right. Let's pick up. We are reading George MacDonald's Lilith. We're now in chapter 29. The Persian cat. I sat in silence and shame. What he said was true. I had not been a wise neighbor to the little ones. Mr. Raven resumed. He wronged at the same time. The stupid creatures themselves. For them slavery would have been progress. To them, a few such lay lessons as you could have given them with a stick from one of their own trees would have been invaluable. I did not know they were cowards. What difference does this make? The man who grounds his action on another's cowardice is essentially a coward himself. I fear the worst will come of it. By this time, the little ones might have been able to protect themselves from the princess, not to say the giants. They were always fit enough for that. As it was, they laughed at them. But now, through your relations with her, I hate her, I cried. Did you let her know you hated her? Again? I was silent. Not even to her have you been faithful. But hush. We were followed from the fountain, I fear. No living creature did I see, except a disreputable-looking cat that bolted into the shrubbery. It was a magnificent Persian so wet and draggled, though, as to look what she was. Worse than disreputable. What do you mean, Mr. Raven? I cried, a fresh horror taking me by the throat. There was a beautiful blue Persian about the house, but she fled at the very sound of water. Could she have been after the goldfish? We shall see returned the librarian. I know a little about cats of several sorts. And there is in the room which will unmask this one, or I am mistaken in her. He rose and went to the door of the closet, brought from it the mutilated volume, and sat down again beside me. I stared at the book in his hand. It was a whole book, entire and sound. Where is the other half of it? I gasped. Sticking through into my library, he answered. I held my peace. A single question more would have been a plunge into a bottomless sea, and there might be no time. Listen, he said. I'm going to read a stanza or two. There is one present who... I imagine, will hardly enjoy the reading. He opened the vellum cover and turned a leaf or two. 
The parchment was discolored with age, and one leaf showing a dark stain over two-thirds of it. He slowly turned this also, and seemed looking for a certain passage in what appeared a continuous poem. Somewhere about the middle of the book, he began to read. But what follows represents not what he read, only the impression it made upon me. The poem seemed in a language I had never before heard, which yet I understood perfectly. Although I could not write the words, sir, give their meaning save in poor approximation. The fragments, then, are the shapes which those he read have finally taken in passing again through my brain. But if I found a man that could believe in what he saw not, felt not, and yet knew, from him I should take substance and receive firmness and form, relate to touch and view. Then should I clothe me in the likeness true of that idea where his soul did cleave. He turned a leaf and read again. In me was every woman. I had power over the soul of every living man, such as no woman ever had in dower, could what no woman ever could or can. All woman, I, the woman, still outran, outsoared, outsank, outreigned in hall or bower. For I, Though me he never saw nor heard, nor with his hand could touch finger of mine, although not once my breath had ever stirred, a hair of him could trammel brain and spine with rooted bonds which death could not untwine, or life, though hope were evermore deferred. Again he paused, again turned a leaf, and again began. For by his side I lay, a bodiless thing. I breathed not, saw not, felt not, only thought, and made him love me with a hungering, after he knew not what, if it was aught all but a nameless something that was wrought by him out of himself for i did sing a song that had no sound into his soul i lay a heartless thing against his heart giving him nothing where he gave his whole being to clothe me human every part that i at last into his sense might dart. Thus first into his living mind I stole. Ah, who was ever conquering love but I? Whoever else did throne in heart of man, to visible being with a gladsome cry, waking life's tremor through me, a throbbing ran. A strange, repulsive feline wail arose somewhere in the room. I started up on my elbow and stared about me, but could see nothing. But Mr. Raven turned several leaves and went on. Sudden, I wake, nor knew the ghastly fear that held me, not like serpent coiled about, but like a vapor, moist, corrupt and drear, feeling heart, soul, and breast, and brain throughout. My being lay motionless in sickening doubt, nor dared to ask, how come the horror here? My past entire I knew, but not my now. I understood nor what I was nor where. I knew I had been,
still on my brow. I felt the touch of what no more was there. I was fainting, dead, yet live to spare. A life that flouted life with mop and maw. That I was a queen I knew right well, and sometimes wore splendor on my head, whose flashing even dead darkness could not quell. The like on neck and arms and girdle stead, and men declared a light my closed eyes shed, that killed the diamond in silver cell. Again, I heard the ugly cry of feline pain, Again I looked, but saw neither shape nor motion. Mr. Raven seemed to listen a moment, but again turned several pages and resumed. Hideously wet, my hair of golden hue, fouled my fair hands to have it swiftly shorn. I had given my rubies, all for me dug new, no eyes had seen and such no waste had worn, for a draught of water from a drinking horn, for one blue breath I had given my sapphires blue. Nay, I had given my opals for a smock, a peasant's maiden garment, coarse and clean. My shroud was rotting once I heard a cock lustily crow upon the hillock green over my coffin, dulled by space between. Come back and answer like a ghostly mock. Once more arose the bestial well. I thought some foul thing was in the room, said the librarian, casting a glance around him. But instantly he turned a leaf or two, and again read, For I had bathed in milk and honey dew, And rain from roses shook, That ne'er touched earth, And ointed me with a nod of amber hue. Never had spot me spotted from my birth, Or mole a scar of hurt, or fret of dearth, Never one hair superfluous, on me grew, fleeing cold whiteness. I would sit alone, not in the sun I feared his bronzing light, but in his radiance, back around me thrown, by fulgent mirrors tempering his might, thus bathing me in a moon bath not too bright. My skin I tinted slow, to ivory tone, but now all round was dark, dark all within. My eyes not even gave out a phantom flash, my fingers sank in pulp through pulpy skin. My body lay death weltered in a mash of slimy horrors. With a fearsome yell, her clammy fur staring in clumps, her tail thick as a cable, her eyes flashing green as a quiet cry of so prase. Her distended claws entangled themselves so that she floundered across the carpet. A huge white cat rushed from somewhere and made for the chimney. Quick as a thought, the librarian threw the manuscript between her and the hearth. She crouched instantly her eyes fixed on the book, but his voice went on as if he still he read, and his eyes seemed also fixed on the book. Ah, the two worlds, so strangely are they one, and yet so measurelessly wide apart. Oh, had I lived the bodiless alone, and from defiling sense held safe my heart. Then had I escaped the canker and the smart, escaped life in death, escaped misery's 
endless moan. At these words, such a howling, such a prolonged yell of agony burst from the cat that we both stopped our ears. When it ceased, Mr. Raven walked to the fireplace, took up the book, and standing between the creature and the chimney, pointed his finger at her for a moment. She lay perfectly still. He took a half-burnt stick from the hearth, drew with it some sign on the floor, put the manuscript back in its place, and with a look that seemed to say, Now we have her, I think, and returning to the cat stood over her and said in a still, solemn voice, Lilith, when you came here on your way to evil will, you little thought into whose hands you were delivering yourself. Mr. Vane, when God created me, not out of nothing, as say the unwise, but out of his own endless glory, he brought me in an angelic splendor to be my wife. There she lies, for her first thought was power. She counted it slavery to be one with me, and bear children for him who gave her being. One child, indeed, she bore, then puffed with the fancy that she had created her, would have me fall down and worship her. Finding, however, that I would but love and honor, never obey and worship her, she poured out her blood to escape me, fled to the army of the aliens, and soon so had so ensnared the heart of the great shadow that he became her slave, wrought her will, and made her queen of hell. How it is with her now she best knows, but I know also. The one child of her body she fears and hates and would kill, asserting a right, which is a lie, over what God sent through her into his new world. Of creating, she knows no more than the crystal that takes its allotted shape, or the worm that makes two worms when it is cloven asunder. Vilest of creatures, she lives by the blood and lives and souls of men. She consumes and slays, but is powerless as to create. The animal lay motionless, its barrel eyes fixed flaming on the man. His eyes on her held them fixed so that they could not move from him. Then God gave me another wife, not an angel, but a woman, who is to this as light is to darkness. The cat gave a horrible screech and began to go bigger. She went on growing and growing, and at last the spotted leopardess uttered a roar that made the house tremble. I sprang to my feet. I do not think Mr. Raven started, even with his eyelids. It is but her jealousy that speaks, he said. Jealousy, self-kindled, foiled, and fruitless, for here I am, her master, now whom she would not even have for her husband, while my beautiful Eve yet lives, hoping immortally. Her hated daughter lives also, but beyond her evil kin, one day to be what she counts her destruction, for even Lilith shall be saved by childbearing. Meanwhile, she exults that my human wife plunged herself and me in despair, and has borne me a countless race of miserables. But my Eve repented, and is now beautiful, as never was woman or angel, while her groaning, travailing world is the nursery of our father's children. 
I too have repented and am blessed. Thou, Lilith, hast not yet repented, but thou must. Tell me, is the great shadow beautiful? Knowest thou how long thou wilt remain thyself beautiful? Answer me if thou knowest. Then at last I understood that Mr. Raven was indeed Adam, the old and the new man, and that his wife ministering in the house of the dead was Eve, the mother of us all, the lady of the new Jerusalem. The leopardess reared and flickering and fleeing of her spots began. The princess at length stood radiant in her perfect shape. I am beautiful and immortal, she said. And she looked the goddess she would be. As a bush that burns and is consumed answered he who had been her husband. What is that under thy right hand? For her arm lay across her bosom, and her hand was pressed to her side. A swift pang contorted her beautiful face and passed. It is but a leopard spot that lingers. It will quickly follow those I have dismissed, she answered. Thou art beautiful because God created thee, but thou art the slave of sin. Take thy hand from thy side. Her hand sank away, and as it dropped, she looked him in the eyes with a quailing fierceness that had in it no surrender. He gazed a moment at the spot. It is not on the leopard, it is in the woman, he said, nor would leave thee until it have eaten to thy heart, and thy beauty hath flowed from thee through the open wound. She gave a glance downward and shivered. Lilith, said Adam, and his tone had changed to a tender beseeching. Hear me and repent, and he who made thee will cleanse thee. Her hand returned quivering to her side. Her face grew dark. She gave the cry of one of those from whom hope is vanishing. The cry passed into a howl. She lay writhing on the floor, a leopardess covered with spots. The evil thou meditatest, Adam resumed, thou shalt never compass Lilith, for good and not evil is the universe. The battle between them may last for countless ages, but it must end. How will it fare with thee when time hath vanished in the dawn of the eternal morn. Repent, I beseech thee. Repent and be again an angel of God. She rose, she stood upright, a woman once more, and said, I will not repent. I will drink the blood of thy child. My eyes were fastened on the princess, but when Adam spoke, I turned to him. He stood towering above her. The form of his visage, visage was altered, and his voice was terrible. Down, he cried, or by the power given me, I will melt thy very bones. She flung herself on the floor, dwindled and dwindled, and was again a gray cat. Adam caught her up by the skin of her neck, bore her to the closet, and threw her in. 
he described a strange figure on the threshold, and closing the door, locked it. Then he returned to my side, the old librarian, looking sad and worn, and furtively wiping tears from his eyes. You'll have to wait until tomorrow for chapter 30. Adam explains. Hey, Lady of Athelion. Good to see you. Very good to see you. So, we've had some... We've had some mysteries unlocked for us. And perhaps some more mysteries revealed. Amy Lester says, well, what does Amy Lester say? Amy Lester says... Something like this. Where did I put that? This is the greatest and the best song in the world. A tribute. Long time ago, me and my brother Kyle here we was hitchhiking down a long and lonesome road when all of a sudden there shined a shiny demon in the middle of the road and he said play me the best song in the world or i'll eat your souls well me and kyle we looked at each other and we said Okay. And we played the first thing that came to our heads. And it just so happened to be the best song in the world. It was the best song in the world. <laughs> I caught your reference, Miss Lester. Yes. Little tenacious D. Little tenacious D, if you will. <laughs> Too funny. How is everyone doing? What is today? Is today a Friday evening? <laughs> today is Friday. All the days tend to run together for me, Flash. Mm-hmm. That is an interesting perspective. <laughs> well, let's see. So that was chapter 29. Right? Chapter 29. And so we have... We have... How many chapters do we have left? We have... Well, there are a total of 47 chapters. So we have 18 chapters left. So we have... Yeah, approximately two more weeks of Lilith. Perhaps slightly less. Because exactly, yeah. some of the chapters are quite short. Mm -hmm. What did we decide we were doing after Lilith? Uh, Bradbury. Oh, that's right. Something the wicked. Awesome something wicked this way comes. <laughs> yes. Ah, Mara's being contemplative. Mara is being contemplative. I'm still... Amy Lester says, So Mr. Raven is the ex-husband of the evil prin princess who turns into a cat. Well, Mr. Raven is a... Yeah, that old story. <laughs> <laughs> that old trope. Two things. That old trope. <laughs> It's been done so many times. Not old nut. <laughs> <coughs> Mr. Raven, it's it's definitely uh his story the story has some twist to it. And then like unlike Mr. Tolkien, there is there is much of allegory. <laughs> Even the allegory has allegory. It does indeed. 
It does indeed. Yeah, I like this. I like the reflection of the raven in the cat's eye. The yeah, cats have weird eyes. I didn't realize that until I started drawing it tonight. <laughs> <laughs> they're simple to do, very small. You blow them up, they're really weird. Pooh and McClary says, If you find this weird, try a voyage to Arcturus. <laughs> Fantastic voyage. A voyage so, to our... Whippy, don't worry about the trouble in nine to five. <laughs> Just sail. Sail. Amy Lester says nobody even knows what that story was actually about, right? Pooey, Pewey, Pewey, Huey, Pewey. Pewey, I don't, you know, for only four letters, that that name <laughs> has given me the most difficulty. And he says, a book that we know was influenced by Mr. McDonald. Mara says, thank you, everyone. I must away presently. God bless all. At some time, we should, we should probably go back to H.P. Lovecraft. October's coming. Mm. Halloween! Though I always have to, uh, always have to check, double check Lovecraft just in case before I read stuff. Just in case his cat shows up in it? Yeah, yeah. We don't want to get banned from YouTube or lynched. <laughs> <laughs> the lurking fear. But he has a lot of lot of easily done in one night stories, right? Yeah. Lady of Athelian says Edgar Allan Poe. Okay, now see Lady of Athelian, you're gonna make me read a poem. All right. Blame it on Lady of Athelia. Edgar Allan Poe. Edgar Allan Poe. In Hawaii, we would call him Poe. <laughs> Edgar Allan Poe. Poems. Edgar Allan Poems. <laughs> This is called A Dream Within a Dream. Take this kiss upon the brow, and in parting from you now, thus much let me avow, you are not wrong who deem that my days have been a dream. Yet if hope has flown away in a night or in a day, in a vision, or in none. Is it therefore thee less gone? All that we see or seem is but a dream within a dream. I stand amid the roar of a surf tormented shore, and I hold within my hand grains of the golden sand. How few Yet how they creep through my fingers to the deep while I weep, while I weep. Oh God, can I not grasp them with a tighter clasp? Oh God, can I not save one from the pitiless wave? Is all that we see or seem but a dream within a dream? Yeah. Lady of Athelian says, What a crazy coincidence. I was literally about to 
request that poem. Usher? Usher Tober? <laughs> Usher Tober? Yeah, I do like uh, Lady of Adelia, and I do appreciate. Um, I do appreciate Edgar's poetry. I ate dinner with Edgar Allan Poe. Yeah. Yeah. Did you eat a little crow? Kind of chubbier than he looks in real life. <laughs> in real life, he looks chubbier than his pictures. He likes crab cakes. He likes crab cakes. No, we went to a. Uh, Poe's death day thing they do in Baltimore right. at his grave. And they have a uh, Edgar Allan Poe look-alike, act-alike person that comes and performs as Poe. Oh, interesting. Did he have the mustache? Oh, he was like Poe, except just chubbier. Yeah. Hmm. He had the hair and everything. Well, that's splendid. And uh, we went to eat afterwards, and he showed up at the same place, and he ate with us. Was he still in character when he came to eat? Uh, he was very suicidal. Was that in character? <laughs> no. Wouldn't stop drinking. Oh, my goodness. Oh. No, he was completely normal, other than his, like, 1800s <laughs> costume. <laughs> During the whole of a dull and dark and soundless day in the autumn of the year, when the clouds hung oppressively low in the heavens, and I had been passing along on horseback through a singularly dreary tract of country, and at length I found myself as the shades of the evening grew on within view of the melancholy house of Usher. I know not how it was, but with the first glimpse of the building a sense of Insufferable gloom pervaded my spirit. I say insufferable, for the feeling was unrelieved by any of that half pleasurable, because poetic sentiment with which the mind usually receives even the sternest natural images of the desolate or terrible. I looked upon the scene before me, upon the mere house and the simple landscape features of the domain, upon the bleak walls, upon the vacant eye-like shutters, upon a few rank sedges, and upon a few white trunks of decayed trees, with an utter depression of soul, which I can compare to no earthly sensation more properly than to the after-dream of the reveler upon opium. The bitter lapse into everyday life, the hideous dropping off of the veil. There was an iciness, a sinking, a sickening of the heart, an unredeemed dreariness of thought, which no goading of the imagination could torture into aught of the sublime. What was it? I paused to think. What was it that so unnerved me in the contemplation of the house of Usher? It was a mystery all insoluble, nor could I grapple with the shadowy fancies that crowded upon me as I pondered. I was forced to fall back upon unsatisfactory conclusion that while, beyond doubt, there are combinations of very simple natural objects which have the power of thus affecting us. Still, the analysis of this power lies among considerations beyond our depth. It was possible, I reflected, that a mere different arrangement of the particulars of the scene of the details of the picture would be sufficient to modify or perhaps to annihilate its capacity for sorrowful impression. And acting upon this idea, I reined my horse through precipitous brink of a black and lurid torn 
that lay in unruffled luster by that dwelling, and gazed down, but with a shudder even more thrilling than before, upon the remodeled and inverted images of the gray sedge and the ghastly tree stems and the vacant and eye-like windows. Nevertheless, in this mansion of gloom, I now propose to myself a sojourn of some weeks. Its proprietor, Roderick Usher, had been one of my boon companions in boyhood, but many years had elapsed since our last meeting. A letter, however, had lately reached me in a distant part of the country, a letter from him which, in its wildly inopportune nature, had admitted of no other than a personal reply. The MS gave evidence of nervous agitation. The writer spoke of acute bodily illness, of a mental disorder which oppressed him, and of an earnest desire to see me as his best and indeed his only friend, with the view of attempting by the cheerfulness of my society some alleviation of his malady. It was the manner in which all this and much war was said. It was the apparent heart that went with his request, which allowed me no room for hesitation, and I accordingly obeyed forthwith and what I still considered a very singular summons. The introduction or the beginning, of course, of the fall of the House of Usher. Well, that was a fun little segue. Poe is an interesting bookend to George MacDonald. <laughs> well, sort of contemporaries, right? Yes. some sort of some sort of midpoint between despair and <laughs> <laughs> oh Edgar Edgar yeah two quite opposite lives for sure yes for certain all right well flash we have kept the good people much over an hour so we should and I see Pui McCleary is saying Bill Poe, Bill Poe Baggins, he's only three feet tall. Bill Poe. Somehow there's been a merger between... <laughs> somehow there's been a merger between the Hobbit, <laughs> Leonard Nimoy. <laughs> Things took a strange turn that evening. <laughs> Metaphors were mixed. <laughs> Similes were spilled. <laughs> no, save us from this allegory <laughs> and his horrible teeth. The allegories, green lizard like creature. <laughs> Amy Lester says so many bonus song times. Yeah. But we should we should say we should say good night before we get too too much silliness. Too much more silliness. Pooh McClary says Nimoy is what we needed in the Hobbit movies. Well, if you watch the Rings of Power and you look at the character Aaron Deer, to me he reads like an elven Spock. So take that one for what you will. <laughs> You've got a form of that archetype. So what did we decide, Flash? We did decide that uh, Spock himself was a reflection of Doc Savage, yeah? He is, yeah. That's what Nimoy said. Just a bit a bit more drier and a bit more visibly yeah. dispassionate, if you will. I think he based his performance on it's like Doc Savage and uh, Sherlock Holmes. Mm-hmm. All right, so we will say good night here. Please do join us about 
the same time tomorrow, and we will see if we can unravel the mystery of now who we understand to be Adam and Lilith, as this, as the Lilith story takes even stranger turns. But again, thank you so much for spending a part of your night with Flash and I. God bless you and your families. Aloha. Good night.